how much do you think you're paying in subscriptions every month? The answer is probably more than you think. Over 74% of people have subscriptions they've forgotten about. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps lower your bills so you can grow your savings. With Rocket Money, you'll have a clear view of your subscriptions, and if you see something you don't want, Rocket Money can help you cancel it with a few taps. They'll even try to negotiate lower bills for you by up to 20%. Just submit a picture of your bill, and they'll take care of the rest. Rocket Money has over 5 million users and has saved a total of $500 million in canceled subscriptions. Stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions by going to rocketmoney.com slash helpmesave. That's rocketmoney.com slash helpmesave. rocketmoney.com slash helpmesave. Dear investors, it's time for a reality check. We're not done with inflation. We're not done with high interest rates. But there are some lessons that we can learn from it and move forward. Hello investors, bonjour. This is Mike Yeroux, founder of Dividend Stocks Rocks and passionate investor. You're listening to the Dividend Guy blog podcast where I and my co-host Veronique will help you invest with more conviction so you can enjoy your retirement. Dividend investors, bonjour. Mike Yeroux here. You're listening to the Dividend Guy podcast and today we just got a bunch of great news, Veronique and I, so we're pretty much on fire, so I'm pretty sure we're going to have a great episode. So I'm going to ask you how you do, but how are you doing, Veronique? <laughs> well, as you know, um, everything is set for selling my house, so it should go as planned, and I'm very happy about that. After 10 months of having visits at home, man, with three kids... It was hell. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so you, you, so you definitely felt the impact of higher interest rate on on selling your your, your oh house, right? Oh my god, uh, I did so much. You have no idea the the times that people were like, yeah, like two years ago, I could have bought your house, but now with high interest rates, mm, no, it's not gonna it's not gonna make it. And I was like, oh. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna spare the word here because it's not gonna be pretty. <laughs> We're going to keep it clean. We're going to keep it clean. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mike, as you said, uh, today we look at what the last couple of years have brought us in terms of lessons. Right after the quick pandemic market crisis, we saw discuss discussions about inflation and high interest rates. It has been around us since then. And I thought... There's probably something to learn from it, right? <laughs> yes, definitely. I mean, it's it's one thing to say to stay invested because we say that all the time. But by staying invested, that doesn't mean to close your eyes and then just like sing a song and think that everything's going to be fine. You still have to watch out your portfolio. Uh, like things are moving. They are changing. The economy, like the environment, the economic environment right now is definitely not what it was two years ago. So it's really important to learn uh, what happened, what was the impact, and how can we modify, maybe just a few tweaks, but how can we modify our portfolio just to make sure that we can move forward and, and we can get, like, go through this new, like, environment where businesses has to adapt to. Mm -hmm. And the other thing as well is over the past 10 years, we, we kind of like got numb as investors because pretty much every single year was bringing like double digit returns. So at one point you're just saying, well, I'm going to add capital no matter what is the investment product I buy. So it's an ETF, it's a stock, it's a high yield stock. It's like, whatever, like you can even make money off from GameStop, which was a dying company. And then we, we kind of like got used to making money easy on the market, but it's mm -hmm. not always this. And, and right now we're getting hit and we're not too sure how to react. So we're going to dig a little bit deeper today on those topics. All right. So let's start with the lagging effect, which is the first lesson. And I've mentioned the pandemic on purpose. I know we are all tired of hearing this word, but everything kind of started there. And it took about two years for us to really feel it. Right. So what does the lagging effect mean for investors? Well, it's um, 
it's really strange because we're trying to adapt with the information we have now, but sometimes something that happened two, three years ago has an impact today. And this is mm -hmm. what's the lagging impact that has. So at first, because of the lockdowns, we started to have chain supply disruptions across the world for a bunch of stuff. And at first we were just like, yeah, okay, so sales are down and that's pretty much it. But mm -hmm. then people started to buy more and more stuff just because it was getting harder and harder to get whatever goods you wanted to buy. And that pushes inflation a little bit higher. And now we have the another weight where the uh, demographic is changing in North America, where we have a lot more people retiring than young people going to work. So we have labor shortage. So people are saying, oh, I'm going to stay, but I'm going to charge you more. So that has an immediate impact on your paycheck as an employee. But for the employer, eventually, he has to come around and raise prices, but he's not going to do it right away. He's going to do it slowly. He's going to plan it. And eventually, what's happening is everything goes up. And by the time that you realize that it is building, it's pretty much like a tsunami. First, you just see like a small wave growing slowly, but it doesn't seem to be that big. And at one point, boom, you have like a, a, a 25 feet wave crashing on houses and you're not too sure what's happening mm -hmm. um the w when we like we just talked about your house not too long ago uh, and that's one of the perfect examples so imagine that someone bought a house during the peak of the market like in 2021 just before you put your house for sale actually yes. <laughs> so in 21 <laughs> early 22 people were buying house like it was like candies at the at, at alimentation costal right so <laughs> And and then they got like some very good rates and imagine that they, they were maybe a little bit more conservative. So they went for a four year or a five year fixed rate. So we're in 21, you have a five year fixed rate of what, what, like two point something percent. So you buy your big house pretty much to the limit that you can afford. Mm -hmm. And, and 22 happens, 23 happens, higher interest rates. You don't really care because you're still paying that two point something percent on your mortgage, but Fast forward in 25 or in 26, when the mortgage will be up for renewal, then you're going to have a big problem. So it's a bit of a different situation in Canada than we have in the United States, where in the States, you can lock your, your rate for a very long time. So that means people will just get stuck in their house because they will not likely want to sell their house and buy another one and now pay like 6 or 7% interest rate on it. But in Canada, they will have to renew their mortgage rate and that's going to hurt. But it's still, we're not going to feel it right now. What we feel right now is just the impact on variable rates because that mm. is immediate. So we still have to wait another three, four, another three, four years before we get the full impact of the first raises. So if the uh, economy continues to grow and we still have inflation and uh, central banks are not in a hurry to decrease interest rates, and definitely they're not right now. I've been repeating this for a long time, but I still have the feeling that a lot of investors think that interest rates are going to plateau very quickly and it's going to go down by the end of 23. I don't see that coming because even the, the the Fed has been pretty clear that they intend to continue increasing their rates. Pretty much the same thing we hear from Bank of Canada. So we're pretty much with the uh, the example of like a frog in a hot water. So at first you put a frog in, in like cold water, doesn't feel mm -hmm. anything. And then you just increase the heat slowly but surely. And at one point, the frog just adapt to it and eventually it's being boiled and doesn't even realize that it should get out of it just because the temperature like increased so slow, but at one point it's just too late. And right now, if you ignore that lagging impact on your portfolio, you might look like a frog in two, three years from now. Right. So Mike, uh, which companies or sectors are the most affected by such an effect? Well, first, the obvious one, when we think about interest rates, we think about debts. So when we think about debts, we think about capital intensive businesses or businesses that are using a lot of leverage to finance their, 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 um, their, their operating models. So everything that goes with high leverage or a lot of buying through acquisition will be um, impacted. In terms of sector, we can think of REITs, obviously, because you have like a lot of properties and, and they mm -hmm. have I mean, that's the whole 
The whole idea of making money out of like real estate is to leverage the properties you have to buy more. And then you do that more and more and more time. And then you grow a huge park and you become a REIT. And then there's a lot of money coming in. But after that, the problem is whenever the debt goes goes up, well, all your properties are leveraged and you have to pay a little bit more, which is going to affect your funds from operation. And this is how this is why the REITs are still going down um, in in 23, not recovering compared to the tech stock that didn't go well in 22, but are recover, uh, recovering. The second sector I'm, I'm thinking of is utilities. We have the perfect example with Algonquin, but besides Algonquin that had like almost a quarter of its debt in variable rate, which got affected right away, all the other utilities that have better debt management are still going to pay the price because they mm-hmm. use, need like billions of dollars every year to fund their projects. And they've been on a roll for the past 10 years because they use that low interest debt, that cheap debt to finance multiple projects. Now the new projects may not be as profitable as before. So they're going to go back to, at, at one point, they, they, they seems to be almost like growth stocks. But I think today you're going to look at utilities and think a a little bit more like the Luke's bonds. So the great utilities, they're going to be stable. They're going to be generous with their yield and they're going to grow very slowly, but they're going to grow. So like a three, four percent, but don't expect something completely crazy out of utilities going forward. It's going to be hard as long as interest rate remains the same. And then we have banks uh, where we uh, we just got um, in, in, in late May. We got the latest quarterly earnings from Canadian banks and the main themes were we're making more money in revenue, in, in, in interest income because we're charging more interest. So that makes sense. It helps them to expand their uh, interest, uh, their, their, mar- their interest margin, sorry. But on the other side, they also raise their provision for credit losses because now they see a lot more people that cannot afford to pay back their mortgage or companies that are struggling and cannot pay their commercial loans. So they have mm-hmm. to increase their provision for credit losses. And eventually it may turn out into real loss and, and they will have a hard time going through that recession. It's not, um, it's not a coincidence that most Canadian banks have not been able to beat the market over the past five years. There's a lot of worries around their ability to navigate through a recession with their big loan books. And finally, because you can see that interest rates and inflation affects everybody. It's pretty much like all sectors, <laughs> but some are like more than others. You'll see also a big slowdown for consumer discretionary. So at first, the consumers still bought clothes, still went to restaurants, still traveled. But And, and it's kind of funny because um, I'm going to Portugal this summer. And I started to look at airplane tickets last October. And between October and February, the time that I purchased my tickets, the price almost doubled for the dates I was looking for. So I had to find other dates because it was just getting crazy. So Mm -hmm. inflation is also affecting traveling and and leisures and everything else. So I, I expect a lot of consumers to slow down. And obviously, those companies will have a hard time to show strong sales going forward. So um, how much time do you believe it will continue to impact us? Oh, that's a pretty good question for my crystal ball, right? Uh, uh-huh. I, I, I think, I think we, we, we are in for another two years uh, beca- because central banks have not done, are not done increasing their rates. So as long as they're not done increasing their rates, we're going to have like lagging impact going forward. So right now we're paying for the first increase that happened in 21. So technically we're going to pay next year for the the ones that happened in 22 and likely we're going to pay in the two years from now for whatever happens in 23. So it's it's going to be at least a good two years of where we're going to have a lot of volatility, but it doesn't mean that we cannot make money on the market. I mean, the market is going not that bad in 23 so far. So we're almost at like half year and, and it's not the end of the world right now in terms of returns. It's a, it's like, I look at my portfolio and it's quite positive. So I think you'll see a lot of concerns, a lot of volatility, mm-hmm. but it doesn't mean that you should sell everything and just wait on your, sitting on your ends for the next two years. 
And it also doesn't mean to buy all banks because you see an opportunity. Like you have to still be cautious, right? <laughs> yeah, definitely. I mean, you can you can like jump on an opportunity, but it doesn't mean that you have to change your com completely your portfolio and go mm -hmm. all in on banks. All right. The second lesson to learn from uh, today's environment is not to jump to conclusions. There have been many catastrophes named lately, and I don't think I've heard the word stagflation more in the last 10 years than I did in 2022. Um, that didn't happen, but it still remains an example of the same lesson, right? Uh, yeah, it didn't happen yet because we don't know what's <laughs> going to happen next. But so far, we are definitely not in stagflation mode. So what happened in stagflation, it, it actually happened once in the 70s. So mm -hmm. thinking that you have to bring it back every time that you see interest rates rising or inflation rising, it's a bit of a simplistic measure because it happens once. It's pretty much like every winter, we're not going to talk about, oh, it's the next pandemic. I mean, dude, it happened like once every 75 or 100 years. So mm -hmm. chances are we're going to have like back-to-back -back worldwide pandemic. I'm not convinced about that. So stagflation is the same problem. Stagflation is when you have a high inflation, but a slowing economy. Because technically inflation show, should go end and ends with the economy. So the economy grows. This means that the companies are selling more Consumers are buying more, so employees are asking for a better raise, and then there's like more demand. The more demand pushes prices going up, and this you have this snowball effect where you have inflation that comes with a thriving economy. This is why also central banks would like to have an inflation around 2-3% because it means that the economy is growing, but not at a crazy rate, but as long as it grows we have people that has job and if they have job, they can contribute to the economy. And, and most importantly, the government doesn't have to pay for them because they become autonomous. So that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. So what happened in the seventies is we had an energy crisis at the same time. And then inflation increased big time, but the economy was slowing down. So we have a recession where if you drop the interest rate, you're just going to fuel more the inflation. So that doesn't like help that much because people are struggling to buy groceries. So it puts central banks in a very difficult situation. But again, and it was like a terrible, terrible decade for the stock market as well. Pretty much the only thing that worked throughout the 70s was investing in gold. In gold. So that was the best investment ever. But when we look at what happened to gold over the past three years, well, since it jumped to $2,000 an ounce in 2020, we're pretty much like going down up to uh, down to like what, like 1800, going back to 2000, like settling at 1900, but there's no real movement. It's just like going up and down between that bracket. And that's pretty much it. So mm -hmm. it has no, uh, it, it doesn't show the benefit it had in the seventies. And, and today's situation is definitely a lot different than it was back 60, 70 years ago, uh, 50 years ago, sorry, <laughs> I'm having a problem with numbers now. <laughs> uh, the economic structure is not the same. We used to have like an industrial based economy. Today we're service based with a lot more technology. Technology back then, like the Microsoft and the Apple of this world, we're not exactly like Amazon. We're not exactly thriving in the 70s. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have the experience. So we know what happened back then. So we know what they did. So Hopefully, we're not going to repeat the same mistakes and we're going to get, get out, out of it faster if it happens again. Uh, we have a lot more companies growing their dividend today than we had back in the 70s as well. So that pretty much bring us back to the time of like the first dividend kings that started growing their dividend. Today, we have plenty of companies in, in different industries that didn't even exist in the 70s. So I'm not convinced it will repeat. And the most important part, the demographic is completely different. As I mentioned mm -hmm. earlier, now we have a lot more retirees, a lot less younger people. And that should like naturally that should keep the unemployment rate very low, which was not the case back in the seventies as well. So trying to guess what will come next 
and manage your portfolio accordingly is very, very dangerous. If we had jumped to the conclusion, oh, stagflation is happening in the in 21, well, then you sell your stocks, you buy gold. Not sure it was a good move because 21 was an amazing year. 22 mm-hmm. was not a good year, but 23 so far has recovered pretty much everything that you have lost in 22. So technically, you're a lot better if you stayed invested and you continue to cash those dividends if you're a dividend growth investor versus going all in in gold and not making that much money. And and if you went into Bitcoins thinking that Bitcoin was supposed to be digital gold and all that stuff, well, in 21, it was trading around sixty to $70,000 a coin. And today, it's struggling to reach 30000 so again, not necessarily a protection of any kind. Uh, the technology is there. We have a full episode on that. Mm-hmm. But so far, it hasn't proven me that it, it, it is able to generate any income anyway out of like being a Bitcoin. It's pretty much like gold. It's a piece of yellow bar lying on your desk. That's pretty much what it is. <laughs> And Mike, about high interest rates, um, I know a couple who are looking for a house uh, in like the upcoming months and they are like in their 20s and all that. So they, they are looking for like a uh, first house, you know, first time home buyers. Mm-hmm. And um, they were very afraid about the high interest rates, thinking that it could jump up like it was in the 80s. And again, I mean, it's not the time to jump to conclusions. And I was like, yeah, well, I'm not so sure because like you just mentioned, the economy is so much different and people are already in debt. So there, there's a limit uh, that banks have to, 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 to raise the, the interest rates, right? Well, technically it's not impossible, but when you think about it, nothing is impossible. Mm-hmm. I don't think, as you said, I don't see how this situation of the 80s could be recreated unless we go into stagflation mode for the next 10 years right. and we have no other ch- or no other choices to say, okay, so now we have to rise interest rate double digit and kill the economy and kill whatever is left. And after that, we're going to be good. But the other problem central banks are facing is the more they raise the interest rate, it's not just for the consumers, but also for countries. Mm-hmm. Like we have this huge talk about the debt ceiling not too long ago in the US. Well, the more you raise the interest rate, the more they will have problems paying down that interest on their own bonds. That will create another problem. And and it's not necessarily something that is is uh, is a good uh, ending for consumers or for the economy or even for the stock market. So will we get to double digit interest rate? I, at this point, I see it's unlikely to happen. But of course, everything could happen in in the future. And mm-hmm. the best advice I could give to that young couple is just like determine your budget and your maximum, and then go way below your maximum when you buy a house. So mm-hmm. then you have that buffer. Uh, over time, you should get promotion. You could, should should make more money as well. So you'll be prepared. And and right now, if you're a bit short, go for a smaller house and and or maybe like buy a, like a, a, a duplex or a triplex, live in it, and and get like rents from from the other tenants to to help you pay the bills. Those are like situation that you can do, which will help you smoother the impact. And do not go variable rate if you cannot afford it. Because mm-hmm. automatically, variable rate is usually the best choice over a long period of time. And when I say long, I mean the the life of your mortgage, like 20, 25, 30 years, not five years. And if you, but if you need to have this financial flexibility to move towards variable rate right now, like on my side, I've been on variable rate since. I bought my first house in 2006 and I'm not going to change. So right now I'm paying a lot more interest rate today, but I've mm-hmm. saved so I've saved so much in the past 20 years. I don't really care about how much I'm paying right now and I have this financial flexibility where it's not going to make the, a difference in my budget at the end of the month if I have to to pay a higher rate. It's not the case for everybody, but then I've been managing my finance and planning it for several years as you're as a young couple you're just starting to learn maybe going variable will not be a smart a smart choice mm-hmm. 
And what other examples could help investors keep calm during challenging times? Well, you know, the one one example I can have that was very, very interesting, and we we got that question in uh, in our uh, webinar in May for our Dividend Stocks Rock members. So every month I do a private webinar where I answer all questions. And back then there were a lot of talks about uh, the uh, U.S. government having to raise their debt ceiling and, and the possibility that they would not raise it. So that means they would default on their, on their debt, which would be c- catastrophic. Mm-hmm. And a member asked, well, what is the impact or should I sell my some of my portfolio, a portion of my portfolio just to be on the safe side? Because I think that last time when it happened, it hurt the market big time. So I went back in time and the last crisis, by the way, they always do that crazy political show and and at like a quarter to midnight they come up with a deal and they save the day every single time it happens so the u.s government never defaulted on their debt it's again same thing with the high interest rate or stagflation it is a possibility but not likely to happen so in 2011 in july of 2011 uh 12 years ago we had the same political show happening. And the S&P 500 dropped about 16, 17% from the highest peaks of June to the lowest moment in July. Interestingly, if you put that, so you're thinking, oh, okay, I could save almost 20% drop. I think I'm going to avoid that because uh, it's going to be good for my heart. But when you look at a full year, so from January 1st, 2011, all the way to December 31st, 2011, the S&P 500 was actually up by 1.89%. So roughly 2% Mm -hmm. total return. So roughly the dividend that was paid, that was pretty much it. But just to show that this 16, 17% loss was just a lot of volatility, but over 12 months, it already disappeared, which was not a big timeframe. So when you put that supposedly crisis in a five or 10 years time frame, you are, you would not even be able to point it on a graph. So trying to panic and go see because they're, and, and, and we're, we're entering into a time of uncertainties, as I mentioned before on this show today, we're, we're going to have a lot of bad news and a lot of noise like this. But what you have to think about it is most of your investment would continue to do business. And mm-hmm. a lot of those businesses will just adapt And interestingly, businesses like humans, it's in our nature, we adapt super fast, super quickly. Whenever we have a a, a problem, we tend to go into solution modes very, very fast. I mean, the the pandemic is like the perfect perfect example. In March of 2020, it was the end of the world. During summertime, it was a little bit better. And by the end of the year, we were already going creating vaccine and and finally seeing the light at the end of the tunnel mm-hmm. that less than a year to almost get her life back almost fully normal it's kind of and and it was supposed to be like a crisis that would destroy the world basically at first mm-hmm. it's kind mm-hmm. of interesting how we adapt quickly we turn around we allocate our resources towards the problem just to fix it as quickly as possible right but mike um All that said, (laughs) is it still too soon to make any conclusion? What's your take after over a year of inflation and high interest rates? That's a pretty good question. Uh, Last year, I expected a recession. I've been quite vocal about that because I was looking at metrics and stuff, and I'm like, of course, the economy is going to slow down because we're seeing interest rate going up so quickly, and yet we're still not there. Like a year Mm -hmm. after I'm thinking we're going to get a recession and I'm still, I haven't changed my mind. I really think that we're going to get into a recession. And I think that it's the only way we can get out of higher inflation is to put the, the country into a recession. And hopefully central banks, what they hope is it will be a smooth recession. That's pretty much the only hope that we can have at this point, but it's still not happening. However, if I had sold my stock somewhere in 22 thinking it would get worse, wow, I would have sold 
like at, at a lower level than the peak level that was roughly in my portfolio. It was roughly at the big, very beginning of 22. So imagine that in, 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 I don't know, like in September of 22, I'm thinking, Hey, you know what? Things are getting worse and worse. We're going to get into a recession. I'm going to adapt my portfolio and I'm going to like go back in cash, like at least 30% just to have some dry powder, uh, to seize the opportunity after the market crashed for good. Well, today I would be looking at the market, looking at the the position I've sold, and they would have all gone up. And I'm right now I'm back to my all time high level, and I would cry because I w- I would I would have missed like a good fifteen twenty percent up market for nothing. So trying to make conclusion, yeah, I'm I'm still expecting a recession, and that's good. But what I did instead is I focused on. Quality. So quality is your best ally. And, and it's the right time right now to make a good cleanup. I did my own spring cleanup a few months ago, looking at my portfolio just to make sure that everything was good. But what I did is I sold some positions, but I didn't go into cash. I bought other companies that I judged they were best quality and, and a strong, stronger dividend growers for, for, for the future. Just to make sure that if we go into a bear market and if we have a severe recession, I have companies that were thriving and will be able to go through that uh, challenging time without any worries. Let's take a quick pause to invite listeners to download the DSR Recession Proof Portfolio Workbook. This guide will empower you as an investor so you can stop doubting your decision and invest with more conviction. What type of tools will they get, Mike? Well, actually, I created this workbook in 2020 during the pandemic crash to help my members to cut the noise and invest with more conviction. It was a tough period and a lot of investors had a lot of questions. It's a workbook, not a book. It means that there's plenty of questions over there to help you evolve as an investor. And every year, I'm upgrading it, adding pages, adding content, and make it more complete. So when you know the answer, you don't stress about the question. And this is how you can invest with more conviction. The DSR Recession Proof Portfolio Workbook is totally free. Visit thedividendguyblog.com slash workbook and download it now. If you already used it, hit the comments and let us know how did it help you. Again, thedividendguyblog.com slash workbook. And that's basically the third lesson that we wanted to share with you today. So base, so like you've said, um, you personally did a spring cleaning to your portfolio back in February, February by revisiting your own investment rules. And this is what we are giving you as a third lesson. In your case, Mike, you've decided to focus on a strong sector allocation, a great dividend triangle and a robust investment thesis. Why those three uh, aspects? Well, here's the thing. As I mentioned earlier today, we got a bit numb as uh, as investors. We were just like, yeah, everything's cool. We're going to make money anytime. So we got a bit lazy with our portfolio. So we we're just looking at our portfolio and just say, yeah, it's going to go up anyways. But now it's time to look at your portfolio with a new set of eyes just because we're not in the same environment. So what was working three years ago may not work today. Mm -hmm. And that is really, really important to understand. It is frustrating because sometimes you had like great, great, great companies like three years or five years ago. Like 3M was a great example of that. Five years ago (laughs) was growing. Yeah, we have have discussed that, unfortunately, right? But it was a a great company five years ago and nobody would have said, oh, I'm going to short sell 3M and I'm going to make a ton of money because it's going to go down 40, 50%. Well, it's happening because any, like everything changes all the time. So this is why you have to keep the same strategy, but you also have to make sure that the companies you bought five years ago or 10 years ago, they continue to adapt to this changing environment. If they don't, well, it may be time to let them go and change for companies that are adapting quickly right now. So Mm -hmm. this is why I decided to 
put a little bit more of the narrative on the side and go back to numbers, making sure I'm not too exposed to a specific sector, making sure that the companies I have grow their revenue, grow their earnings and grow their dividend, and that I am confident that my investment thesis in them are still valid today and will still be valid in the next five, 10 years. You've also considered, Mike, to bringing back your rule about selling on a dividend cut. Is that still on the table? And do you believe all investors should do the same? Well, we're all different, right? So it, it, I think all investors should follow their investment rules, which is super important because if you, you if you have rules just to say, oh, yeah, I have rules and I'm a good investor. Well, you have to follow them. If not, they're not rules. They're just like stuff that you say. And if you don't act, I mean, action are a lot louder than words. So it's really important to have clear set of rules. And one of them is I sell when there's a dividend cut. I made an exception during COVID time, but that was the only time in my investing in my investor's life where I owed shares of a company that cut or suspended their dividend. Mm -hmm. Since then, I got a few dividend cut in 22. I sold all of them on spot. And it's very interesting because a lot of investors think, yeah, but when you do this, you pretty much sell at the worst timing possible. And a lot of investors are bringing back the example of Algonquin where it's up like roughly 30% between January and June. It's up 30%. So you're thinking, well, if I sold when they announced the dividend cut, I pretty much sold and missed 30% growth. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the past 12 months, you're still down 32. So you got a little bit more back of your money but now you're stuck in that I hope it will recover fully. And it, it may take 10 years to recover. It may never recover. And, and here's an interesting um, fact here. I've pulled out two examples, Manolife and Suncor. And they're kind of funny. They're like a lot in the news lately, especially Suncor, because they rose their dividend aggressively. So a lot of investors are just like super bullish about Suncor, thinking, oh, it's an amazing business. But if you look back in time, just before the financial crisis, both companies had eventually had to cut their dividend after the crisis. So somewhere around like 2010 or something like that. But if you look at what happened between 2007, uh, 2007 all the way up to 23, the stock price for Manolife and Suncor are still negative. So you bought it. If you forget about the dividend, you're down like 20, 30% just for the stock price over the past, what, like more than 10 years now. Mm -hmm. If you consider total return, so you consider the dividend because obviously it's part of the return. So that's fine. So you consider the return. And over that period of time, which is actually like 14, 15 years, you're at plus 24% for Suncor, plus 19% for Man Life. Not analyzed rate of return, total return. Like just you invested $100,000 and you reinvested those dividends. So 15 years later, you're at 124000 like $24,000, like that's nothing. And, and mm -hmm. it's even worse for man life. So sometimes thinking, oh, I'm going to owe until it recovers, that could say, and, and I'm not, I'm going to spare you how much you would have made if you have invested in the market in general. Uh, that's, that's in like hundreds of percents of return. Mm -hmm. So just for the sake of recovering one single stock in your portfolio, instead of like looking at the tree, look at the forest, look at your portfolio in general. Yes, it stings. You have a loser in your portfolio, but my strategy personally is all about dividend growers. So how could I keep a stock that not only doesn't increase its dividend, but cut it? Yes, you're going to have like saw some small bounce back. And if you look at the price history of Man Life and Suncor, it went up, it went down, of course, but it never picked it up to into a thriving business where the stock price keeps going up like there's no tomorrow. Of course, I'm cherry picking two examples here. I'm pretty sure that we can find examples of dividend cutters that became great businesses again, mm -hmm. but is relatively rare because if the business had to cut their dividend, to to get them back on the right track, they cannot just do what they have they did in the past. They have to change their business model and become successful again. 
And that is definitely easier said than done. Right. So, Mike, in the end, what's the most important lesson to learn, in your opinion? Well, the most important to lesson to learn is we are entering in a space where we're going to have more and more noise because changes and uncertainties create that noise. So you're going to have like a bunch of headlines. You're going to have like a bunch of people telling you to do this, to do that. And people will tell you it's different this time. It's always a bit different, but your strategy should not. Like a, a, a strategy is not about investing for the next 12 months or for the current market. A strategy is for the next 50 years. Mm -hmm. So the way you should manage your portfolio is pretty much like a big cargo. A big cargo cannot turn 180 degrees on, on, a, on a quarter. It has to plan ahead revisit the plan and then stick to the cap. So if they have to move, they will move very slowly and they do some tweaks. But in the end, follow your strategy, make it sure it's really clean and clear so you know that you can focus on it and you don't have to wonder and then start listening to the noise. Because if you listen to the noise, you're going to get lost and confused. That's for sure. I mean, there's just too much information. And conflicting information is even worse because you're just going to get into a dilemma. So it's always the same, like, it's always the same advice right now. Yes, things are moving. So review your portfolio, making sure that the company you have in your portfolio is adapting. Most of them are adapting anyways. Most of them will do fine. Mm -hmm. But some of them, they may hit a wall. And this is the time where you want to do that spring cleaning. Now it's like summer cleaning, but you want <laughs> to clean up your portfolio to make sure you don't have those companies that will hit a wall. And you just reallocate this capital to better companies, stronger, like with better dividend triangle, dividend growth, and so on. Well, thank you, Mike, for sharing your thoughts on an important topic Listeners, this might be the first difficult time in your investing journey, but it won't be the last. Taking advantage of such a situation to learn is, I believe, the best way to address it. I hope that we've been able to bring more conviction your way today. Don't forget to download our recession-proof portfolio workbook for free at thedividendguyblog.com slash workbook. This tool can definitely help you revisit your investment rules and do your spring summer cleaning. <laughs> For the show notes and related content, visit thedividendguyblog.com slash 131. Until next week, stay, stay invested. invested. Hey, fellow investors, it's Mike here. I hope that you have enjoyed this episode. Please note that the Dividend Guy Blog podcast is at no time issuing buy or sell recommendation. Please do your own due diligence as this podcast is recorded for information and hopefully fun purposes only. Uh, make your research. Make sure you do your stuff. We're not responsible for your losses or your profit after listening to this episode. And until next one, stay invested. How much do you think you're paying in subscriptions every month? The answer is probably more than you think. Over 74% of people have subscriptions they've forgotten about. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps lower your bills so you can grow your savings. With Rocket Money, you'll have a clear view of your subscriptions, and if you see something you don't want, Rocket Money can help you cancel it with a few taps. They'll even try to negotiate lower bills for you by up to 20%. Just submit a picture of your bill, and they'll take care of the rest. Rocket Money has over 5 million users and has saved a total of 500 million in canceled subscriptions. Stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions by going to rocketmoney.com slash help me save. That's rocketmoney.com slash help me save. Rocketmoney.com slash help me save.